You know, every, every time you go and you don't, you don't know what you're going into. Um, no, I don't think it, it affected our play. I think it, it actually increased our play. Uh, we got better. Every country that we played, uh, for example, Barcelona, uh, they, they, every different country, they, they for example, they, they love to blow the whistles. So we had 134,000 fans at Barcelona Stadium and all 134,000 of them started blowing the whistle. We didn't even know what we were doing. We, we, we couldn't even play. So everybody had their thing, their, their, their forte. Uh, Bar I mean, uh, London loves light shows. So inside their dome, we, we couldn't even see it. It was blinding our wide receivers. And then Frankfurt, they were cheering for everything. We would have a holding call and they'd be cheering. So uh, <laughs> it made it easy. It made it easy because we were ambassadors. Everything was a new experience to us. And um, and we did pretty well, and, and I tell you, it was, we were grateful for uh, having that league. You know, I, I find it amazing that you got to experience playing football in Europe. Not only that, but to be there for historical events, to be there, be there when the, to see the Berlin Wall fall is something I, you know, people that have got to experience, I, I, I can't even imagine how, the, how it impacts them. You know, I remember when it happened, I was 20, 21 when it happened, and I remember seeing it, and it was just a great feeling being able to see it on TV. I can't even imagine what it felt like when, you, when it happened and you were actually there. Yeah, we, we, we were overwhelmed with it. We, we, were, we had the opportunity to be representatives from the United States. Um, it, it, when that wall came down and they cut the yellow ribbon and, and that bobcat pushed it down, you can see the whites in their eyes from the west side and the east side. And I tell you, it was the most humbling experience I've ever had. So uh, thank you for, for that. Hey, just kind of on that subject, but it's not sports related. The coolest story ever, uh, my, my tío Mariano was stationed in the Cuban army in East Germany. And the wall came down and he said, well, ain't gotta go back to Cuba now. And that was probably the coolest thing about the wall coming down for my family. My uncle is now a, a citizen of Germany and there's a blue-eyed blonde Leon out there, which is my cousin, my son, and my uncle Mariano that looks nothing like me, brother. Well, Alex, our founder, Mr. Ray Cayoso, does have a question for you. Yes, sir. Alex, first of all, I want to thank you for being a pioneer for Latinos in football. I mean, you're part of a very exclusive club, not only being a Latino in the NFL, but a Latino that was a starting quarterback in the NFL. So I want you to diagnose two Latino quarterbacks got some issues. First of all, what do you see in Tony Romo, that doesn't let him take it to the next level because he, not that I'm worried about, I'm an Eagle fan, but he's a sad <laughs> guy. The guy's got the skills that just can't push through. And Mark Sanchez, what happened? Now he's my backup quarterback with the Eagles. I yeah. hope he gets a little PT. But so tell me, from what you've seen, those guys showed a lot of promise, but it doesn't seem like they can kind of take it to the next level. What are you seeing in their game? Well, I, I tell you, Mark came out a year early. Uh, in my humble opinion, I think he might have, he should have stayed. One more year, he might have had that one more year experience. He probably would have won a national championship. But Mark is a good guy. Uh, I see Mark play in, in high school uh, at Santa Margarita. Uh, I remember seeing him in college. Uh, I just think Mark needs to do it. He needs to go back to basics. You know, he go back to basics and, and, and forget everything that happened in the past. Stay focused and uh, uh, do the best you can with what you got. So, you know, we see a lot of young quarterbacks today. You know, we look at Tom Brady. Uh, Payne Matt, even Andrew Luck, they're willing to do that extra work uh, to fine tune their craft. And I don't think Sanchez was willing to do that kind of work. You know, he, you know, you hear about him at the parties. He was more important. It was, uh, it was important for him to coming out in magazines. And what, for players today, young players, high school players, young college players, you've been through the through the rigors of the NFL, uh, playing in Europe, uh, college, uh, major college football. What advice do you have for young players? What do they need to do to take it to that next level? I mean, how much work and dedication do they really need to have? You need to watch film. You need to watch film. And I can't overemphasize enough about watching your opponent. Uh, you gotta live in the weight room. You gotta live in the training room. You gotta be that leader. And it, it, 
and what I see today is that they're too busy doing other things. They're, uh, with all the gadgets going on, they're more uh, focused on playing the Xbox than they are going to practice. Um, I tell you, at, at the three years that I was at St. Paul, at lunchtime, I go into the weight room and watch film. Until we, the Monday after we won our championship, I came out and I didn't even know where the seniors sat at, at lunchtime. So, it, it, to me, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. I stayed focused. Uh, I knew my opponents, and, and, and you know, you just you got to be that that teammate. You got to be that leader. You got to be the general on the field, and and you got to stay focused. You know, you touch on a good point. A lot of uh, a lot of things are available for, for kids nowadays. You know, growing up, we didn't have Xbox, we didn't have Twitter, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have Instagram. We wanted to be out there playing, trying to get better. And these kids today, it seems like they almost have that sense of entitlement, like, I have skills, hand it to me. They don't want to put in that work, and it's sad that you've seen a lot of great, potentially great athletes, you know, piss it away. Yeah, definitely. You know, back then, you know, I was never fed with the silver spoon. And nowadays, with all the social media, that you can get into. Um, I think it, it, it's kind of ruining our lives. It, it's kind of like controlling our lives. You know, we're at a push of a button or, or a text. Um, you can communicate with anybody. And and back then, we didn't have cell phones. Uh, we we were we were strained to have to go into a pay phone, public phones. And, and now those are obsolete. Uh, I tell you what, the communication. It's getting too easy to just say, no, I'm, I'm not going to be at practice with a text. Instead of getting up and going out there and, and getting it done. So you, you got you to gotta be there. You got to put your work in. Uh, whatever you put in is what you're going to get out. Well said, Alex. Well said. Yes, we do have a question from Jim Lujan. Jim Lujan. Hey, Alex. Got a question for you. This is, and this will be kind of really interesting to see what you, how you feel about this. Uh, how do you feel about the modern day protection of the quarterback? And do you think enough is being done, or do you think sometimes on the field it goes a little too far? You know what I mean? Like, like just they barely get touched and they call something. What's your feelings on that? Well, uh, I think the quarterback's being overprotected. You know, I, I play in an era where defensive ends, outside linebackers, used to pin their ears back and we had a big bullseye. And I, I happen to weather the storm. So nowadays, if you're putting too many limitations on a quarterback, uh, you're making them a little softer. And, and to me, I, I, you have to go out there. You're just like a normal player. You go out there. You gotta, you gotta prove your, you know, what you got. Uh, if you're being protected, uh, I don't think you're gonna be able to put or show the entire ability that you normally have. You know, because you're always gonna have. The, that uh, that insurance, that knowing that, that somebody's going to call uh, uh, roughing the passer. So I think they should maybe take out some of those, you know, limitations. That's awesome. And then you also think that the NFL, since they're making so much money on quarterbacks and stuff, they should take care of them, you know, after the fact too, right? Absolutely, absolutely. I think um, you know that the NFL should should step up to the plate and uh, take care of all their players, you know, not only just quarterbacks, but all those players. You know, I suffered a concussion against the Miami Dolphins, and uh, I tell you what, uh, I don't even remember getting dressed. I don't remember getting on the plane. I don't remember part of that. And uh, it's kind of scary, you know, when, when that part of your life is, is a blank. And they're making, they're making so much money. And they're making money, yes, absolutely. And I tell you what, it, it's a high-performance business. And, um, you know, I, I think they have deep pockets, so I, I certainly think that they should take care of us. Yeah. Yeah, just to let you know again, we are, you are listening live to Latino Sports Talk. You can catch us live at latinosportstalk.com. If you do have any questions, please feel free to call us, 213-529-0685. And we do have a very special guest, uh, Mr. Alex Espinoza. Uh, we do have a question for Mr. Espinoza. Uh, can you please tell us your name? Hi, this is Bill Moran, a New York Jets fan. Whoa! Whoa. Yeah. We won't hold that against you. <laughs> That's all right. Let's take up. Jim had a question about quarterbacks being protected. You play for the Chiefs. The Brady rules in the books because of the Chiefs. How do you feel about that? 
<laughs> First of all, my condolences on your and your Jets, but uh, I'm oh, we play this season. Don't worry. I, I think it was called Giant Stadium. I think back then. Back then. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. You know, being at Arrowhead Stadium, those fans, in my humble opinion, are the loudest fans in the world. Now, uh, I, it was awesome to play against Bill Moss, uh, uh, Jack Del Rio. Uh, we had. Steve DeBerg, we had, uh, uh, we also had uh, Stefan Page and Emil Harry. Uh, we had a bunch of guys that were running around, and I tell you, I, I, they made me feel like like family. You know, once you get an opportunity to to make the roster, um, you know, you're 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 embraced, and uh, it was the most gratifying time that I ever had, just being in the NFL. Uh, I, I tell you, one experience that Renee had asked me. What was the most uh, exciting experience? Well, I got an opportunity to play against the Miami Dolphins. And I went in, and we were playing on national TV. So once I went in, I called a play, and they, the, the referee blew the whistle and said, TV timeout. So all of a sudden, it gave me more of an opportunity to get more nervous. So once, once the referee uh, blew the, uh, the whistle, for a minute, just for a second there, a fraction of a second, I went underneath the center, I said, damn, I'm in the NFL. <laughs> and I just, it was just so surreal. Um, you know, everything that was there at Joe Robbie Stadium was just, was just an awesome, awesome experience. Awesome. Let me have one more question with you. As a Jets fan, I have no purpose in life for the fish. They can be destroyed off the face of the earth for all I care. As a Chiefs fan, do you feel the same about any team? I, I, I tell you what, um, I get asked all the time, especially being here in L.A., you know, are you a Raider fan, are you a Ram fan? I said, no, I'm a Kansas City Chief fan, to the end, to the core. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Les Miller gave me an opportunity. Uh, he went to go see me play at Iowa State. I got the call, and, and I'll tell you, I'm a Chief fan to the, to, to the, to the end. But is there a team you hate? Who's your enemy? The you know what? I'm not going to say that I hate the Raiders because I'm in LA and, and I need to get home tonight. What about the Broncos with Shark? I'll well, say it for you. I hate the Raiders. Yeah. Well, the Broncos back in the day, they, they had a gentleman by the name of Jack, uh, John Elway. And uh, I tell you, I had the distinct pleasure of meeting him. Well, we were up in uh, Frankfurt and his dad was coaching us. John would come and see us play during the spring. And um, when, while I was at the Arizona Cardinals, we actually would practice against uh, uh, the Denver Broncos. We went to Greeley, Colorado and played them. Um, John was the most exciting, the most strongest arm I've ever seen. And he was pretty humble at that the time that I, that I met him. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Alex, I um, wanted to ask you real quick, uh, when you were in the World League, I know that each team how to allocate certain players from that country to play on that team. Did you have some German vatos that could straight out play football? We, we, <laughs> we had four, four, uh, four Germans. Uh, that were we're talking Germans. football, not football. Yeah, we're talking football, the American towel. Uh, we had a, a kicker, uh, uh, Stefan. We had two, an offensive lineman and defensive lineman that we had a wide receiver uh, that was in the military that, that, that played for us. But, I tell you, I, I think uh, Olaf, Olaf, our defensive lineman, the guy was bigger than a house. And, and, and kudos to the German team that, that just won the uh, the World Cup. Uh, they deserve it. But um, this guy was bigger than life. You know, he was huge. He wasn't as as knowledgeable of the game, but if you gave him direction, uh, he knew what to do with it. Okay, again, you are listening live to latinosportstalk.com. Uh, we, we are coming live from Garfano's restaurant just outside of the Cal State LA campus. We had a very special guest, Alex Espinoza. Uh, Alex, I wanted to thank you to take, uh, for taking time out of your schedule to come sit with us, talk some sports, reminiscent of your great uh, high school, college, and your career in the NFL, as well as playing in, in Europe. Uh, is there anything you want to plug right now? Anything you have going on? Oh, actually, I do have one question. I know you have a son playing in high school right now. Does he take any advice from you, or does he look at you, oh man, you don't know what you're talking about? 
Well, I, I tell you, my son looks like if I carried him for the nine months, you know. <laughs> and I tell you, uh, I'm the only, as far as I know, the only father that actually named him, legally named him QB. So uh, he's got that for life. But uh, there's, t there's times where I would give him advice, I would coach him up, and he doesn't really listen because he sees me as dad. And uh, there's times where there's things in the internet, maybe uh, I've been the all-time passing leader or uh, total offense leader in the big eight, and he says, dad, how come you never shared that with me? How come you never told me that? I go, son, it's because I'm your dad, and I don't want to be remembered with you as the all-time leading passer. I want to remember, be remembered as a good dad. So you can ask me anything you want, uh, it's out there. So, uh, but I think it, in my humble opinion, my daughter is gonna be the prettiest quarterback in the NFL. Well, I think being remembered as a great dad is more important than re uh, being remembered for the record you set Glenn and Iowa State. Absolutely. So, Kudos absolutely. to you for that. Absolutely. Uh, Alex, I, I wanted to tell you, you know, I coach at Torres High School, I coach your boy. Uh, and as much as I love coaching the kids, I love that team, I love what we've accomplished. I've also loved the fact that someone that I admired from afar for a lot of years, I actually got to meet. I think you're one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. I told you that I think you're a gem to the community of East Los Angeles. And being a lifer, doing football all my life, man, I'm so fortunate to have met you. Thank you for, for inspiring every kid that's ever played football on the east side, that they can be bigger than life. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank it's you. my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, once again, you are listening to Latino Sports Talk. We are coming live from Garfano's Restaurant at 5468 Valley Boulevard in Los Angeles, just near the Cal State LA campus. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit of some, uh, maybe some L.A. topics here. Um, I've been ripping on this team for pretty much their, their entire season, and I don't know if I'm in the minority here. I know Renee thinks we're spoiled being a L.A. fan. Talking about the Lakers. Championships, baby! Yeah! yeah. Don't live in the past, brother. They're, uh, I'm Lakers. sorry. Hey, <laughs> I'm, we'll I'm purple and gold all the way. We'll be back. It's been uh, a very disappointing year, to say the least. Uh, we, we actually were, we're actually seem to be proud that we won a, a, an, an auction today to get a basketball player. It's, we have sunk that low. Uh, in case you haven't heard, uh, the Lakers have picked up Carlos Boozer in, in the waiver auction. We had the highest bid. Uh, some people seem to be happy about it. Um, I, for one, am not. Uh, it's, this is no disrespect to Boozer. Well, actually, yeah. Because if we look at uh, his stats from last season, his points per game, his rebounds per game, and his field goal percentage, the lowest it's been since 2002. His player efficiency rating is the lowest ever in his career. Three years ago, yes, I would have been happy with his pickup. Today, not so much. Uh, well, well, look, I'm, I'm going to go, I, I, I took some time to digest this uh, from the time we found out, and a good friend of mine, Tony Sanchez, I mean, I text him, we got Boozer, and he said, all this means we ain't gonna win shit this year. And um, I thought that was pretty accurate. But, now that I've had a couple of hours to digest it, a couple of hours of sleep on it, uh, think about it, yeah, about five, six, seven beers. Um, Eight or nine. But who's counting, right? Uh, I started thinking about, how about if we were to get the best Carlos Boozer we can get? And how about if we get the best Jeremy Lin we can get? And let's just say Kobe is the Kobe of old because, look, if there's one SOB I'm not going to bet against, I'm not betting against Kobe. I agree. He's got great work ethic, but he proved it last year. Kobe's about Kobe. When we got Dwight and Nash, what was the first thing out of his mouth? It's still my team. And that's a little disappointing. That's why we weren't getting to the big name free agents coming to LA. And that, that was my Twitter question today. Is Kobe the number one reason we are not attracting free agents to Los Angeles? I'm gonna say it is. As much as I love Kobe and I feel indebted to him, I feel the fact that nobody wants to play with him is a huge factor. 
he has not been the best teammate to a lot of guys that have signed as free agents that have come. Uh, us losing Dwight Howard, as much as I think that guy's not going to amount to nothing, and I think Renee knows how I feel about Dwight Howard. Uh, I still feel that, you know what, Kobe may have ran him off a little bit. Still think he's soft, but... I think Kobe ran him off a little bit. Soft in the toilet paper, baby. <laughs> Tom water. If I might just add to this, uh, as a Phoenix Suns fan, it's actually fun to watch this Lakers franchise fall apart before our very eyes. Uh, as a Wolf fan? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> as a Phoenix cricket, Suns fan. Cricket, cricket. <laughs> so all I can say is I relish in this. It's It's been fun to watch. But I also kind of have to worry a little bit about the future of the organization because the fans have been, basically the Lakers probably have the best fans in the NBA. But it, you know, you do, I do feel bad for them in the sense where, how do you, how do you like this? How can you get used to this when you know nothing but winning? And you're right, uh, the Lakers fans, I know we've talked about it, we said LA fans have been spoiled. Yes, we have spoiled in a good way. Dr. Buss, when he bought the organization, he turned them into winners. A consistent winner, and that's what we've been used to our, for, since 1979. And we're not going to accept anything less. You know, this was an abysmal season. Some people can look at it, oh, it's a rebuilding year. We don't accept rebuilding in Los Angeles. That's why you, if you go to the Staples Center, you don't see division championship. You don't see Western Conference championship banners hung. All you see is world championship banners, and that's what the Lakers are about. So to go through this and knowing we're going to go through this for a while is very disheartening for a Laker fan. We'll stick with our team. True Laker fans will stick with us, and we are going to rip Kupchak, Jim Buss, and to a degree, we're going to rip Kobe. Uh, because if, if Kobe can what makes Kobe great also is what hurts the Lakers. He's got that drive, and not many players have it, but his drive takes away from getting bigger talent here. And I'm, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm, he's still new uh, as an owner, but I just have serious questions with Jim Buss running uh, player personnel. I, my humble opinion, I believe Jeannie Buss should be the one running it. Uh, hopefully Jim Buss will figure it out quickly and get the Lakers back to where they belong, uh, continuing for, uh, for championships. You know what? I... I think uh, just on the subject, because we had all this, these great Latina women here today, the fact that here we sit in 2014 talking about how we'd love to have Jeannie Buss, the daughter of Dr. Buss running the team, and not the son, speaks volumes of what we think about our women out there. So I think that's something that I wanted to bring up. Jim Luhan has a question. First of all, Jeannie Buss is a great Latina, and she should run the Lakers. And number two, hey, Laker fans, yes, we're going to suck for a year, maybe two, possibly three. But you know what? If you don't want to be not on two, this bus, not three. Oh. <laughs> if you don't want to be on the suck bus, then hop off, because we don't want y'all. Exactly. And the real Laker fans will stay on it and suffer with pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Jimmy Newhart Manifesto. Now, I will say the one positive that I see with them signing Boozer is they did get him for a relatively low amount. He signed him for $3.25 million. So it's a low amount. That's um, nothing. That's it's nothing. It's nothing. Nothing for a guy average 17 points. And hopefully it will motivate him to play even better, to get a bigger contract next year, and, and I'm hoping that's a good thing. Let's, let's pass the mic to this young man. He got a lot to say, man. Let's, let's, what's your name and what's your question or comment about the Lakers? My name's Tony. I'm a huge, huge fan of Nisam Leon here. That's my buddy. Hey, hey, hey. But I'm a huge Lakers fan, born and raised in Los Angeles, Boyle Heights community. Um, I think we got all the boozer on the cheap. Like uh, he just said, um, we just we paid 3.25 mil for him. I think his average um, last year was about 17 points a game. So yeah, he's not the old boozer the way he used to be when he was about to coming off of Utah. But hey, I'll take him. We're in a transitional period right now. I have no doubt for the Lakers. I'm a huge Lakers fan. I will be back to the promised land. Is it going to be within Kobe's last two years? Maybe, maybe not. But hey, you know what? Kobe's bought us five, five great championships along with Shaq. 
And you know what? I'm a huge Lakers fan to the end, just like uh, just like he just said. We'll, we'll go ahead and suck it up for the next two years. We'll be fine. How many? How many? I know we have New Yorkers here, people from Arizona. They can, I don't even know. So in my lifetime, since I was born, I haven't even seen a championship in those in those states. Right? Nothing against them, but we are spoiled here in LA. We'll, we'll, we will be back in about two, three years. That's for sure. And I have no doubts in LA pride here. Uh, Lakers for life, baby. Lakers fan. Well, yeah, it'll, you'll have a championship here. It'll be with the Clippers, right? Right, George? Oh, no. I support the Clippers, too. So can we, can we talk about, I'm from Philly, but can we talk about the Clippers? What kind of future do they have? And do they have a chance to, I'm not saying take over L.A., but do they have a chance to rival the Lakers in popularity here in, in L.A.? No. Well, I, what, I, what I feel right now, if there's ever been a time for anything great to happen for the Clippers, it's now. Well, it's not going to happen now until this whole... Um, and I re refuse to say that idiot's name until that whole fiasco is dealt with. But there's going to be that cloud over the organization. Tukowitz? <laughs> yeah, Are we talking about Tukowitz? I mean, the the shame of Boyle Heights. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, look, I, and I touched on this subject. Uh, not only is it sad that a Los Angelino owner had to pull that crap with being a freaking racist. But the worst thing is, he happens to be the owner, the only owner in professional sports that happens to be from my city of Boyle Heights. So that absolutely sucks. And, uh, you know, I really hate the fact that uh, he's still there. Look, one of the things, uh, the, the guy that's, being the, that's the GM right now for the Clippers said, what's well, really hard to bring free agents is we can't tell them who our owner is. Yeah, and, you, and to answer your question, right? Yeah, I think the Clippers do have a chance to win a, a championship in the near future. They got great talent, and I said it when they got them. The biggest acquisition the Clippers got last in the offseason last year was Doc Rivers. Absolutely, he's huge for them. And you saw, you're seeing a change in their in their toughness. Blake Griffin actually, I thought had his best year ever. He was a little bit tougher. He wasn't being pushed around as much because he had that reputation of being a little soft, and you weren't seeing it this past year. Uh, Don Rivers is the one who actually mentioned, you know, I go into free agent meetings, it's just me. I can't bring anyone else with me. I can't bring an owner. I can't bring in, uh, like, the GM. But we don't know what's going on, and, and that's why the Clippers are big. Now, with saying that, though, if you're going to pick one coach right now besides Pop, Doc Rivers. Doc Rivers is the guy. If you're going to have a guy that's going to be selling the organization, that is the guy you want selling the organization. And they can win, like LeBron, not one. Not two, not three. They'll never rival the Lakers in Los Angeles. It's going to be a mini Clipper town for a while, but this is always going to come to basketball. This is always going to look. Let's, let's get it straight. The Clipper fans are all the guys that can't get into the Laker games, and that they, that's all it is. I will say. Alrighty, that's all it is. My life, I've known. I have my ex brother in law, my wife's brother, uh, one of my uh, another friend of mine. And I think there's one other person I can actually sit here and say, yeah, they've been Clipper fans from day one. Out of all these quote-unquote Clipper fans, you see the flags on the cards with the, with the price tag still on it. A lot of bandwagon fans out there. Let's be real. All right, you know what? Let's let, let's talk a little bit real quick about this, and uh, we'll add a little something to it. You know, the Cavs are open to dealing Wiggins right now. Yeah, they're yeah they're uh, LeBron is huge on wanting to get Kevin Love on that team. And it seems that Wiggins is the one thing that's going to hold up that deal. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I would do it. Renee, what do you think, man? Is Kevin Love really the answer to a winning basketball team? Has, a, has he won a playoff game? Last time I checked, I don't think he's been in the playoffs. No, but if you put him, they're looking. You put him, LeBron, Bennett, Kyrie Irving, you got a contender. in a very Well, the East is actually getting a little bit stronger. But you put him on that team, and suddenly the Cavaliers are a serious contender. Well, here, here uh, you know what? I'm going to sort of agree with uh, with Renee from this standpoint. You got a guy that, yeah, obviously he doesn't have anybody around him, but you have a guy that's been in there and hasn't been able to lead his team to the playoffs, hasn't been able to do uh, anything spectacular on his own. We haven't even given Wiggins a shot because I want you guys to remember what Kevin Durant looked like when he was a supersonic and in his first three years. And this is the type of upside that this guy Wiggins has. You give him the opportunity because you may be trading away a commodity that is gonna be super. You don't know that. And I'm not so sure 
that we're a hundred percent sure when it comes to Kevin Love. Well, absolutely. I mean, a, a guy like you said with Andrew Wiggins, this guy has nothing but the highest ceiling. We, I think, we might have seen the best days of Kevin Love. So, I mean, how is this the final piece to a championship team? All you really do need is LeBron. He makes everybody better, yes. But Kevin Love doesn't have to be that final. Well, Vegas seems to think so, because as soon as they got LeBron, they're, they're the odds-on favorite to win it all. I think Vegas, as smart as they are, may have forgotten that there's a team in the West, the San Antonio Spurs, that are the defending world champions. And, you know, Renee, you talk about the upside with Wiggins. We've seen a lot of players come into the NBA with a lot of upside, and for whatever reason, mostly injury, it didn't pan out. I'm thinking Sam Bowie, Greg Oden. Everyone was like, is it Durant or Oden? They went with Oden, uh, Portland to Gordon, and he, unfortunately, because of injuries, he hasn't been able to do it. So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of questions about Wiggins because he doesn't have a consistent jump shot. Yeah, he's great, he's flashy. Can he defend? If he develops a jump shot, look out. I'll give you that. But until then, I think Love is more, you know, you know what you're gonna get with Love. He's gonna hit, he can, he's got a jump shot, he can play on the boards. He gives him another option where he can't just focus on Kyrie and LeBron. He can actually help spread out that floor. What I have seen with a lot of Kevin Love game is that he's, he's more concerned about padding his statistics instead of being a team player. I don't see him playing very hard defensively, uh, you know, and maybe that's to the fault of he, him being on a team that he doesn't really care to be on. But with that, I mean, Wiggins, come on, this is a wing player league, and if you have wing player talent, like high ceiling talent, that's really what you want. It's not a power forward league, it's not a big man league anymore. We've had the same topic thrown out where it is now more of an athletic kind of lead. Yeah, but let's not forget, Kevin Love can't hit the three. He can't hit from like 18 to 20 feet consistently. He does have a jump shot. So he's not just the man who's going to play with his back to the, to the basket, because that doesn't work anymore in, in, in today's NBA. He can play outside, and that's where it helps to spread out the court. And that's going to it's gonna open up lanes for Kyrie Irving. It's going to open up lanes for LeBron. Uh, I'm a little hesitant about it, but if push came to shove, I'd probably make the deal. Provided you can get Kevin Love to commit long term. That is key. That's the key. Definitely key. But let me put it this way. In a, in a way, you have Kevin Love. I think it's six, seven years he's been around now. Versus a guy who is entering his very first year. Well, let's not forget, Kevin Love came out of college after one year. So he's still relatively young. 25. He's, he's still young. Thank you very much. Yeah, 25. So he still has to reach his peak. And when he hits it. He's great now. When he gets to that level three, four years from now, the man's going to be devastating. And this is coming from a guy who does not like anything about UCLA basketball, but I respect his game when he was in college. I thought he was a great player. I thought it was, personally, I thought it was a mistake for him to come out after one year, but it's worked out for him. Being on the wrong team, uh, look at the coaches he had. Look at the players he had around him. Uh, Rubio was gone for over a year, so he really hasn't had a lot of talent around him to produce a winner in Minnesota. Hey guys, if I could just chime in again together, this is Tony, live here from the finals. Um, speaking on the topic, I would I would do a deal in a heartbeat. I think Andrew Wiggins is a big question mark right now. Yeah, he has a lot of talent, he has a lot of upside, but you're, you're in LeBron James' prime years right now. You don't have three years, four years to wait around to see if Andrew Wiggins is gonna do anything, right? He can be, he can be Greg Oden, he can be a lot of the players that have a lot of upside, and just bust, and just bust, and they're just bust. I'm not calling him a bust, I don't think he's gonna be a bust, but I will just do this in a heartbeat. I think you don't have any time to waste. I think LeBron's really pushing for this, for the same reasons that I'm pointing out. Um, just like the real George Lopez pointed out, Kevin Love's a great passer for one. For one, he's a, a stretch forward, he can he hit the outside shot. Um, he's a very very basketball um, savvy, his mind is great. He's a great teammate from what I've seen. He's been playing with a bunch of chumps, let's be honest. He's been playing with a bunch of chumps in, in Minnesota, right? Um, and I think you do that. You do that trade in a heartbeat. Trust me. I, coming from a Laker fan, I don't want to see that trade happen because I'm still ho I'm holding out hopes for him to come to LA somehow, some way. Since his roots are in LA, but I mean, this guy, this guy's come from a basketball family. His background is basketball. I think, I think he's a great, he's a great basketball um, player. Same thing. I'm not a, I'm an SC fan. I'm not a huge UCLA fan, but I, you know, when you see talent, you gotta recognize. It. When, you, when you see the game, you gotta recognize the game.
And just remind you are listening to Latino Sports Talk coming to you live from Garbano's Restaurant in the heart of Los Angeles near Cal State LA. You can catch us live at latinosportstalk.com. Uh, you can listen to us on Mixler. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to call in at Erico 213-529-0685. Uh, and, uh, on the subject of uh, LeBron, if LeBron doesn't go back to Cleveland and win it all, gentlemen and ladies, is this a failure? No. No. Because it wasn't about rings. LeBron going home, I know Renee thinks it might have been a PR move, because you kind of mentioned it. I think, you know, he just wanted to go home. He wanted to raise his family back where he grew up. He knew it's a great area. To have a hard time with yeah. that just yeah. simply it's, because it's about when you're right. giving me about the not two, not three, not four, I think and now it's about your family. I, this is what I think. All right, this is this is why I love my magic. All righty, because it never got too tough for magic. I think I think it got a little tough for LeBron having to have lost his third final. All righty, I know he's been there five times, right? But he's lost three of them. All righty. He has a hard time. Magic lost, I believe, three of them. Correct? Four of them. Never got too tough for Magic. Never tried to cry his way out of Los Angeles. So, it's a saying that, it's a I think idea. going home is the cop out. Well, you gotta going remember. home was the easy route. Well, we That's gotta, what I think. got to remember, back in the 80s of Magic, Magic wasn't going to call Bird, hey, come play with me. Let's bring home a championship. We weren't going to see you, that. Oh, and you know what? Let me say something, okay? Because uh, I said something to ESPN. That, okay. I said something to ESPN on the Mike and Mike show when they were talking about Barkley said he would have never teamed up. Well, you know what? Barkley is a liar. They he didn't have the Philly for the, I mean, Phoenix for the ring. He went to Houston and teamed up with Olajuwon and Pippen. So Charles Barkley, Mike and Mike didn't have the balls to call you out. But the Latino Sports Talk... Dot com does. Sorry. All right, because we keep it real. All right. You had no wibbles, and now you say that you didn't want to team up with anybody. That's a bunch of BS because you did it. Well, in the same, in fairness, in the 80s, the Lakers and Celtics had the whole league juiced so that they would make, you know, the whole league was, was set up so that you guys would get the best players. Well, we had the Larry Bird rule back then, and, and with right. L.A. and Boston being Jerry dominant West, in the 80s. Jerry West funneling Paul Gasol to you guys. Correct. Well, what's the problem? Advantages. And, and, and is that a problem? Well, thank you. Correct. What's the problem? Well, well, it was well, yeah, right. Magic didn't have to run yeah. away because hey, everyone came to him. Memphis could have said no to that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it, it was different in the 80s, and ratings, you know, like I said, Magic and Bird saved the NBA. Boston and L.A., the two... No disrespect to the Knicks, but the two most iconic franchises in the NBA, they got hot at the right time. TV exposure was getting bigger. What better way to keep it going? We, I remember the 80 championship series against Philly, having to watch it on, at 11 o'clock at night because it was on a tape delay. And we're talking about the NBA Finals. You know, everyone had to see it on tape delay. Magic going for 42, 15, and 7. Not a regular season game. The NBA Game 6 against the Finals. The finals. Sorry, you know, we took it from Philly that year. I'm sorry. <laughs> It is a different. It wasn't maybe too time. young, but we did sweep the Lakers one year in the finals. So. I don't want to talk about it. Anymore. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. <laughs> but for that to happen, what happened? You had to bring in someone to do it. So you know, it started. It was back a very back. legitimate trade. And, and I agree. It, that was one of the best moves Philly got when they got Moses Malone. Speaking of Philly, since I'm jumping in for a second, my young boy here said, you jump in the sports. I said, I found a lot of those sports talk. So let me tell you something. First of all, I think you have a Philly guy here. I think I should get a thank you because I want to remind everyone what Philadelphia has meant to Los Angeles sports. Let's not forget that the only the reason the, the, the shining light in otherwise a dismal Lakers situation, your only hope is in Mr. Kobe Bryant, who is from Philadelphia. Lower Marion. So let's, 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 so let's clap it up for Kobe Bryant from Philly, everybody. I ain't done, brother. Let's clap it up for Lower Marion. I ain't done, brother. Let's go to baseball for a second, and let's remind our, let's remind us that the last two managers that have brought championships to the Angels and the Dodgers, Tommy Lasorda and Mike Sosha from Philadelphia. Let's not remind you. Let's not forget 
that the two greatest players for those two franchises in the last 25 years, Mike Piazza and Mike Trout, are from the Philadelphia area. Let's not forget that you're... Oh, well, 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 Hold on, we're gonna hold on, hold on, argue, we'll argue, we'll make that law for you. Let's not forget that with your Kings, you have three former Flyers, Richards, Carter, and Williams. So I just wanted to step in there and that's to get to my, my question. To George Lopez. I'm in this city and I've traveled the whole country. I'm in this wonderful city with a great sports tradition. And I drive by all these wonderful coliseums and ballparks and centers, and I sit here and wonder, why does this not wonderful city with wonderful football fans get to have an NFL football team? Thank you! Because it's boring when you're from Philadelphia and you gotta take a road trip and play in a Super Bowl in Jacksonville, Florida. No disrespect to Northern Florida, there's some podunk towns in the NFL. So George, you're one of the leaders of the LA Rams, Come Back to LA Movement. What can we do, what can you do to get an LFL football team back to LA. I'm gonna quote Cuba Gooding Jr. Show me the money. <laughs> it's bottom line, that's what it's about. It's about that the money. No one can agree on a location for a stadium. We've had Irwindale, thank you, L. Davis. We've had by the convention center, Farmers Field. Roski's got a stadium ready to build in the city of industry. Close to home, yeah. Close to home. Five minutes from my house, and I'm hoping it's that one, but Snack Crocky, oh, my Rams. Notice I said Rams, not St. Louis. He's bought 60 acres, but honestly, part of me is wondering if he's using that as leverage to get a better deal in St. Louis to keep the Rams there. I'm hoping that's not the point. I'm, off the case, I'm hoping he's using it to actually bring the Rams back to LA next year. But it comes down to the transfer fee. You know, moving a team out here is going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. Plus, you've got the expense of building a stadium. LA is not. LA, the state of California, they're not going to pay out of taxpayers' money to build a stadium. We already know that. So someone's got to be willing to finance that deal and not cost it. Well, here, here's the thing that I've been saying for a bazillion years and nobody wants to listen to it. The facade at the Coliseum is wonderful. You have already the parking lot. You have the freeway exits. You have everything in place. Everybody doesn't want the Coliseum. But if you were to renovate the Coliseum, make it right around a 70,000 seat stadium. Well, see, that's the problem because now SC is in control of the Coliseum, and there's no way they're going to drop from 93,000 to a 70,000 seat stadium. Well, I think they got to find some common ground because, look, the whole building of a new stadium, guys, it's been 20 years since the Raiders left. No, 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 no. The Rams. This is a Ram town. Raiders are a generational team. Okay, that's fine. But that's the last time we had professional football in Los Angeles. Right? And I got my compadre Hugo back there when we went to go see him against the Seattle Seahawks. Tony! Hugo, I still have my $13 uh, stub when we went to the AFC Championship. And a Samoan uh, security guard knocked me out on the field when I ran out there. <laughs> Best hit I ever took, man. I'm telling you that. But uh, I think that's something that they have to maybe experiment with, talk about. Look, we've been talking about a new stadium for a long, guy, for a long time, guys. Irwindale's been in the works, what, 15, 20 years? Oh, Al Davis just pretty much took Irwindale's money. Right, and that's it. So at some point, let's talk real. I, I signed up for the Farmer's Field thing. I'm on their mailing list. And, and I'm not getting squat. Yeah, you, know, you hear things now, it's it's pretty much a dead deal, I think, because the uh, city of Los Angeles, they're actually looking for different things they can do with uh, the convention center. So I actually think that the football's Harvest Field, I think that's pretty much a dead deal. Wait a minute, real quick, Renee, you, you're one up on us on this one because you're not on any of the other ones, but you have a football team. And so I want to know how does that feel? Well, uh, you know, Arizona Cardinals fans actually have something to be happy about because this team has surprisingly turned things around from the Bidwell family. Was it 10-6 and six last year? Yes, wow. and just missed out on the playoffs, unfortunately. But uh, for many years, there was the reputation of being a laughing stock. And it, it's horrible for Cardinals fans because we, you know, we do take pride in our football. 
And, uh, you know, things have come around since that stadium has been built. A lot of, a lot of positivity, um, especially with the Kurt Warner era where it gave a lot of fans hope. You know, we had a Super Bowl, a Super Bowl loss, but, you know, we, how many of us can say we've actually seen a that Super Bowl? That was the best, one of the best nine and seven teams besides the Giants that I've ever seen. You know, and I would have never thought I would have seen the Cardinals in the Super Bowl. And that's supposed to, you know, the Kurt Warner issue. Yeah, Kurt Warner was huge in helping that franchise turn around. The last two coaches you guys had, that was big. They actually got in coaches who knew what they were doing with the personnel they had. He knew, uh, Wizenhut really knew, knew how to exploit Fitzgerald's great talent. And his areas are Bruce. Bruce Arians. Arians. Yeah. He proved it in that, as an interim coach with the Colts. The man could coach, and he carried it over to Arizona. They bought into his system. And I honestly believe they would have been a dangerous team in the playoffs had they got in last year. You know, we, we've talked about this in different settings where you have to put ego aside, and eventually what ends up happening when you look at the Cardinals is you get the right people in <laughs> In the, you know, you know their spots, working their jobs, getting good drafts, getting great free agent signings. Um, you know that culture has changed. Arizona Cardinal football culture has changed when uh, you get away from Bill Bidwell letting him make all the decisions. Um, I, I don't know if you, your time with Bill Bidwell, maybe you can uh, shed some light on here for us. I just wanted to say before. The Kurt Warner, there was another guy that wore number 13 for the Arizona Cardinals. Who, who would that be? That would be myself, Alex. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 good question. You know what? You know what? Uh, Arizona has the opportunity to come full circle, have now been the, the, the sleeping giant in the NFL. Uh, certainly the Bidwell family is good to me as well. But I, I, I tell you what, uh, there's another guy by the name of Jeff Hornacek. It's a uh, Iowa State Cyclone, so that's a shout out to uh, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, All right, man. The Phoenix Sun, so. <laughs> now, again, you are listening to uh, Daily Sports Talk. We're coming live from Garfano's Restaurant, 5468 Valley Boulevard in Los Angeles. We're near the Cal State LA campus. Come on down. Have a good slice of pizza. It's cold beer, cold drink. Come join us. Uh, we are live on Mixler. You can call us with any questions, any comments at area code 213. 529-0685. And uh, Lisa, let's talk a little bit something about it's near and dear to us and kind of go Renee a little bit. Let's talk about the Dodgers. How about them Dodgers, man? Now, this is a little bit, I don't know, I guess kind of a negative here. A uh, story came out today that uh, Matt Camp isn't happy. Uh, he's been playing left field a lot for a part of the year and wasn't really happy about it and he's pretty expressed his desire to be pro. He turned to center field. And it came out today that he would actually be open to a trade. Well, here's the thing, man. If, if you are so worried about the position you play, and that outweighs winning a title, because we're not talking about playing that. We're talking about playing a certain position. God, man. I, see, I saw Pete Rose sign with the Phillies. And say, Mike Schmidt, you're you're the third baseman. I'm gonna go over there and play first base to see if we can win a world title. And I know that Ray, you know this better than anybody. They went and won a world title. You've seen guys like Ripken switch positions. Sorry, Kemp, you're not Ripken. All right. I hate to blow this bubble, and I love Matt Kemp. You know, and, and I agree, and I'm, I'm kind of glad my oldest isn't here because he, we, him and I go back and forth about Matt Kemp and his favorite player, Mike Trout. Uh, what Kemp is doing is, you know, if he's complaining about not playing center and he, and he wants to be in center, he's putting his needs above the team, and it's real disappointing because I've, I've been a huge fan of Matt Kemp. He struggled through some injuries, and let's be honest, he wasn't playing the defensive center field that we've been accustomed to. And that's why Matt only made the switch. And they've been winning since it was done. Granted, Carl, uh, Carl Crawford was hurt, so there wasn't that rotation issue. There's been some good chemistry. And now, with this story coming out, is it going to break up that chemistry the Dodgers have in the clubhouse? It's almost like we're living in a bizarre world because the FCL Puig has matured, and Matt Kemp is showing immaturity. It makes me wonder, is Kemp dating a celebrity? The last time we saw something like this, he was with Rihanna. Yes, and uh, his history of... Miley Cyrus, maybe? Ooh. 
He's let, he's letting distractions get in the way, and now it seems like he is uh, complaining about personal things, like you said. And uh, at baseball is the epitome of a team sport, but sacrificing, and he is doing the opposite right yeah, now. Kent needs to remember what made him great. He was a team player, where he had some of the best skills in baseball as a center fielder. He was a five-tool player. Uh, honestly, I don't know if he feels threatened by what Mike Trout's accomplishing with the Angels at such a young age. And I know my wife's here. She's probably shocked a little bit that I'm actually complimenting Mike Trout because I always give my son a hard time about him. Um, it's it's just real disappointing to see that. Uh, another disappointing rumor that I've heard, and I'm hoping it does not happen because I've been ripping this guy for a long time. Uh, the Dodgers were in trade discussions with the Phillies for um, Jonathan Papadopoulos. Oh, I heard that. Yeah, and uh, Ray, uh, I don't know, you've had some uh, feelings about Jonathan Papelbon. Uh I don't know if you've heard the story that the Dodgers... No, Ray got up the minute we mentioned Papelbon. The Dodgers are uh, rumored are to have been in this trade discussions with uh, the Phillies for Papelbon. Yes, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. I want to give a shout out. To some, some of my colleagues that have come into the building, let's say what's up to Sonia Tatiana that came in to join us at Latino Sports Talk. So I want to give us a look. And we have a Cavaliers fan that has joined us. So we're going to talk about the transfer return of LeBron in a second. But let me tell you something. The, you can chart the decline of the Philadelphia Phillies as the power of the National League the moment we signed Jonathan Papelbon. He was highly overpaid. And beyond his price tag, one of the reasons the Phillies were so successful is the team chemistry. We had winners like Chase Utley, Jimmy Rollins, um, Ray Holiday on the on the roster. And once he was a high mercenary, he he messed up the chemistry of the entire team. He made it clear he was just there for the paycheck, and he didn't never wanted to fit in with the, the Philadelphia cult, Phillies culture and philosophy. And we have gone downhill ever since. Good riddance. He will break your heart. I don't think he's a big game player. I'm hoping to let him. Ned, I'm hoping you're listening to us today at Latino Sports Talk. You I'm better not. be listening. You, Mike Brito does. Do not bring Donald hey. on here. He was once a great talent in Boston, but read the writing on the wall. There was a reason why the Red Sox did not fight the keeper. I think, you know, uh, relievers, they go through that period where they're on the decline, and I, uh, he was a great talent at one point. I just think we're seeing, we, we saw the best of Papelbon already. I, I agree, man. He seems like he'd be like a team killer. And I wouldn't want that guy. I think we do have good chemistry. I think the guys are playing well. I'm really sad to hear about Kemp. Uh, but here's the reality of it. If he doesn't want to be on this team, we're not going to switch you and make, have you do what you want. I have a lot of faith in Mattingly, man. He's made some good calls up to this point. We're playing the best baseball the Dodgers have played in a long, long time. Uh, I think the Dodger ownership has done the work, and uh, I think it's time that that uh, the guys decide, hey, we're gonna work at this together. Um, real quick, uh, how about Goodell talking to the Raiders about they're gonna have to stay there? Not so much stay there. I don't kind of I don't like what he did, where he's basically telling him get a get a stadium in Oakland or share the stadium with the 49ers in Santa Clara. And if you've seen Levi Stadium, it's all 49er now. Why, if you're a 49er fan, why would you want the Raider fans there, guys? Well, you know, let's be fair. Oakland fans are good. I, I've gone up to Oakland, where I went up for a game, where the opposing team's color, walking around. Oakland fans are like, hey, you're here having a good time. Enjoy the game. You're not, you know, if you're gonna be an idiot, then they're gonna tell you something. But I was there to have a good time. Now it may be. You know, it's almost like if the Clippers and the Lakers. Oh wait a minute, they do. Sorry about that. You know, it, you know, it, it may be different in Oakland when they're playing Kansas City or when they're playing Denver, especially Denver. Uh, but if you're up there to have a good time, they're not gonna, there's not a problem. If I am the city of Santa Clara. I'm sorry, I don't want the Raiders in. Well, the problem is with the Raiders, the reputation they're getting is with what happened here in L.A. for those 20 years. That's the problem. You know, they got the, the team got a bad rap because of some of the fans. Granted, there was some great fans here, but there was also some knuckleheads, some power drinkers who just went and wanted to polish off a 20-pack and then look for a fight and say, I'm doing it for the Raiders. And, and gave the Raiders a bad 
bad image. This is what Bolitnikov would want. Granted, you know, the Raiders, they thrived on that bad boy image, but they were also great teams, and they never encouraged, they, they never encouraged the fans in LA. Back Matt then. Miller wanted to be like this. Al Zeta wanted it to be like this. You know, Al Zeta was, uh, you know, he was, he was crazy, but uh, I just don't like the Goodell basically handcuffing him. You know, he's, he's pretty much saying we're not coming to LA. And remember what happened the last time the NFL told the Raiders they couldn't come to LA. L. Davis won a loss. All righty. Uh, one of the things now they're talking about, I love this, man. I'm getting tickets to this. My buddy Tony. Sanchez, who was here, was in New York for the NFL draft this year. And I told him, you got to try to go, man. But Tony was going to Yankee games and doing all kinds of stuff and going to fancy eateries and visiting Bobby Flay. And so he couldn't, he couldn't do all of that. So, but they're talking about the 2015 NFL draft potentially being held in L.A. I'm telling you who's going to be there. LatinoSportsTalk.com is going to be there. Yeah. All righty. I, I like throwing digs at Arizona. What does that say when there's a city with no NFL team and the NFL wants to come to that city to hold their draft and they don't want to go to the desert? LA is a large market. You can't ignore them. And I think we, we were talking about this earlier today. How can you ignore this city by not having a franchise here? I mean, it's to me, it's highway robbery. The, yeah, but it's also going to be the right franchise. Uh, uh, I, I, want, I, I want to correct you on that. There is a professional football team here. They're called the USC Brook Trojans. <laughs> the best college football I know can buy. Oh, not buy. Let me tell you something. You know, Our athletes earn their scholarships. You know, I'm sitting How's here. How's Temple doing? <laughs> this time of year. I'll tell you, bro. I'll tell you. What, you know, we actually believe it's amateur sports. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's interesting. I don't know if it's, we've been almost an hour and a half. And weekly on Latino Sports Talk, especially last year, and I like your amended nickname, the real George Lopez. He is the truth, there's no question. Was a real, a very, very confident Dodger fan. Dodgers came just a little short. Kind of been typical last year to the Dodgers coming a little short. And so it's, you guys are looking good here. I believe you're in first place, you're right there. It's the halfway point. Let's talk Dodgers. I mean, is this the year the Dodgers are finally going to get it done? And is it possible that we could have a Southern California World Series? Because well, the Angels are doing pretty well as well. I'll tell you. Game and a half out. I'll tell you, and it's unfortunate my wife's here because she's going to hear me admit this. The uh, the Angels have been impressing the heck out of me lately. They're playing great baseball right now. Uh, to be, a, you know, as well as Oakland's been playing all year, to be a game and a half behind. Uh, and with Weaver not doing as well as you expected, but C.J. Wilson not doing that great and being on the shelf uh, speaks a lot about what Mike Sosa is doing with that team. Uh, but the big surprise, I think, for Angel fans, Gary Richards. I mean, 11-2 at the break. He's just having a phenomenal year. Absolutely. And I'm actually glad I picked him on my uh, fantasy baseball league. Thank you to my brother-in-law, Alfonso, for suggesting I get him. <laughs> uh, it's possible we could see it. Uh, if the Angels don't catch the A's, I actually expect them to get in the wild card, and they could be a dangerous team in, in the playoffs. Uh, yeah, it, the only thing that's worried me about the Dodgers is they're hitting right now. I mean, the, the four-game series against the Padres, they take three out of four as far as five total runs. Yeah, that, that's tough. But but look, we have the bats. We have the bats. Did we have a question over here? Oh, okay. Now, Diana, what, talk to us. What do you think about your angel? You're an angel fan? Yes, I am. So talk to us. Where, what is the status report on the angels at this point in the season? You know, they, I went on July 5th to one of the most amazing games I've ever seen in my life. Um, we have, you know, it was the innings, there was, um, I believe, 2-0, and then just one inning, they gave up like four runs, and then three innings with zero, you know, nothing, nothing scored. I was like, oh my gosh. Seventh inning, boom, Angels just lit it up, on fire. I think they scored nine runs in that one inning that lasted 54 minutes, that half inning. And I don't know, it just, you they have that momentum, you feel it, and the crowd feels it, and there's just like a power that I haven't felt there for quite a long time. 
And I feel, you know, this is this could be the year. They're coming out strong and they're playing. And Mike Trout, you could see he's having fun. And, you know, that's what makes it fun too. And the kids love it. My son loves it. He gave us a nod up when we're in the outfield one of the times. Um, I don't know, I just think the Angels... They, they, they have the potential. They can do it. You know, I think when it comes to the two Southern California teams, we got two players on each team that I think about right away. Mike Trout and Clayton Kershaw. And the two thing, the one thing that both of them have in common, they're hungry. They're not satisfied. They want to keep getting better. Uh, I'm, Kershaw, when this, he wins a Cy Young Award last year. He had a great year. Season ends, and sitting, instead of sitting back on his laurels, he goes to his personal pitching coach, how can I get better? How can I improve my slider? He's not satisfied. And we see the same thing with Mike Trout. He wants to keep getting better. And yeah, he's having fun and he's playing. Mike Trout's a throwback. He's playing the game the way it should be played. He's, he's a, a new version, actually, of Pete Rose. With more power. I think in a lot of ways, you're absolutely correct. He's the new Charlie Hustle. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, I, I think as a Dodger fan, you know, I mentioned this the other day. I'm tired of watching the Gibson home run. You know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm 26 year 26 years removed from that sucker. I don't want to watch it anymore. And uh, God, I, hey, we saw how intense that Ducks King series was. Can you imagine a Dodgers Angel World Series? What that would look like? I think I think it would be off the charts. And you know. Again, to remind you, we are coming live from Garfano's Restaurant in Los Angeles. This is LatinosportsTalk.com. We're in the City of Angels, home of the 2014 Stanley Cup champion, L.A. Kings. Yes, Jim, you have a question. Oh, I have a question. Um, you guys are Latino Sports Talk, right? Why don't you guys... So we're told. Why don't you guys... Why don't you guys ever talk about the Angels or the Dodgers or the Angels? Why don't you guys ever talk about Why don't you guys ever talk about Latino Billiards? <laughs> We don't talk about Latino bowling either, or Latino hack a can I, can I bring something up to the listeners that nobody knows? You have a guy sitting on your panel, a regular host, that has bowled a 300 game in bowling. What? And that, boy, that guy's name is the real deal, George Lopez. George, fantastic. Thank you. Thank yes. So proud of you. Can you YouTube that 300? And it, uh, no, it's not on YouTube. Oh, okay. It was not on the Wii bowling either. It was real. Wow. Outstanding, George. Hey, there's a lot of athleticism involved in bowling, man. I've always said, any, 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 to any sport that you get better at while you're drinking, that's a sport I want to be associated with, man. We have, a Latina has something to say on some sports. Okay. So this is Sonia. Sonia, Sonia. welcome. Thank you. That's right. So Sonia, you have some good news, don't you, as a basketball fan, don't you? Can you share with these guys your happiness? Can you say? So Sonia, you're a Cleveland Cavalier, a Latina from Cleveland in the building, everybody. Wow. Okay. But the best news is yet to come. Oh, Spurs. Oh, Spurs. Spurs? <laughs> yep, San Antonio. You're Cleveland and San Antonio? I was raised in Cleveland, and uh, I actually now live in San Antonio. Okay, well, let me ask you, when LeBron left, did you burn your jersey? I didn't burn my jersey. Oh, so you still have it? We still have it in my house. Oh, good, we're good. Like <laughs> so are you more of a Spurs fan or a Cavaliers fan? I'm a Cavaliers fan. I grew up in Cleveland. Um, but I think being in San Antonio... Be in that environment, you just really like love that team. So. Oh, you know, if we had the mad Mexican with us right now, this would be an interesting conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, Ajo, you know, you're missed, you're loved. We wish you were here, but this would be a very good conversation right now. Mad Mexican is a huge Spurs guy. Oh, yeah. See, that's, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. Well, what's going to happen now when Cleveland meets? Uh, San Antonio. Yes. Hmm. You know, that's a good question. We'll have to wait. Who and see. did you root for when they played in the championship? We were actually rooting for San Antonio, regardless of LeBron at that point. Yeah. But now that he's home, then that's 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 gonna be a tough question for my family. Go Lakers. <laughs> yeah, there you go. 
<laughs> yeah, once again, you are listening to Latino Sports Talk. We are coming live from Bacamas Restaurant. You can catch us at latinosportstalk.com. Uh, you can also catch us on Mixler. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to call in. We reached that area code 213-529-0685. And our beloved host, our special host. Uh, First of all, a little trivia for the scene. <laughs> Who is the greatest Latino athlete from Cleveland? Greatest wow. Latino athlete from Cleveland. I don't know if Sonia knows this one. Per the greatest me, Latino man. athlete from Cleveland. Personally for me. All right. I played in Cleveland, but I was raised in Cleveland. Oh, Ooh. That's what I'm talking about. Does anyone know who's the greatest? No, now Latino you got athlete? me. He was an NFL player. I think he still might be in. Remember the Ohio State and Indianapolis Colt? Wide receiver, Andy oh, Gonzalez. Andy oh, Gonzalez. Oh, Cleveland yeah. Cubano. That's right. Cleveland Cubano. So a little trivia there for you. I just wanted to introduce everybody. We at Latino Sports Talk, and you're listening live online at latinosportstalk.com. We have an extremely special guest. All of you are very special. Of course, we all know the scene's very special. He was in the short school bus at some point in his childhood. <laughs> we, have a, we have a Latina pioneer in the sports journalism industry. This is a woman that writes for ESPN's website and during the uh, when the World Cup was on and one of our foremost authorities on USA soccer, Mexican soccer, give it up for Andrea Soccer Canales from ESPN. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Andreas, welcome. Welcome. So glad to have you here tonight. I'm very glad to be here. Well, the first question I have I have for you is what was your take on the overall experience of the World Cup? I think overall, the World Cup, it went off pretty well. I think people were uh, apprehensive with the demonstrations that had happened in Brazil. And even the fact that Brazil's team was kind of fragile, really, and everyone worried, like, what if Brazil was that early? Are people going to riot? I mean, is it going to be crazy? And uh, that didn't happen. I think, you know, uh, yes, Brazilians were really devastated when their team went out. But um, they rallied, and uh, they still showed up to the third place game, and they still um, they still supported the sport that they really love. And honestly, I was proud of them for that because, to me, soccer is bigger than just you know any team I follow. It's really about you know the beautiful game and being in love with the sport and the competition of it. It, it does make you hate the bad parts about it, about it, like when the refs miss calls or when players die. But, you know, you can't have love without some hate, right? Well, I heard FIFA actually stood for falling, falling in fake agony. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have never seen so many actors play a sport at once. There were a lot of fake agony. Uh, I'm a novice fan in a sense. I've only, I only really watch soccer every four years for the World Cup. And I have to, I, I watched most of the matches this cool. year. And I... I couldn't believe how excited it was. I was really into the match. We keep talking about Memo Cho against Brazil. All the oh, saves that he made. Uh, Tim Howard did against Belgium in, in the knockout stage. It was just some great soccer matches. Even the final match, you know, if, if one nothing, it was. If you like matches like that, you know, I'm like from not being a big soccer fan. I loved it. I thought it was great. And, and you know, we have our, one of our colleagues who actually said, you know, in two months, America's not going to care about soccer anymore. And to a point, I agree with him a little yeah. bit, but I'm actually, I know there's a Man U match against the Galaxy coming up. Before, I wouldn't think anything of it. Now, like, if I could go, I wouldn't mind seeing it. So yeah, it actually possible. kind of it kind of got my attention a little bit. I, I know I have one question, and I know that this whole community, which is 99.99, uh, Mexicano, do you think it was penal? No, fue penal. No, this is the other thing. It was, it was very much the best of times and the worst of times. Like you said, there were some incredibly exciting games and amazing saves, but then there were players who were diving, and the refs did not really make enough of an effort to, to uh, depart players who did that. Okay, I think I think Robin dove earlier in the game and didn't get parted for it. I think that one was a foul. Anytime there's a foul in the box, that's a foul. But it was very soft, and the way he exaggerated, ah, oh, it just turns my stomach. Because he did exaggerate, you know? And, uh, and he did it because he wasn't called 
on his exaggeration of the film. And so, I don't know, I can't even sympathize with Robin when his spells are legit, because if he's always falling all over the place... Um, yeah, because it really becomes a guessing game, yes. you know, for, for the officials, and, I, and that makes it extremely tough, and, and I think... At that point, why do you give him the call when you didn't... Um, you know, you didn't you didn't card him for simulation. That's interesting. Like if, if the other one was total made up and it was, then why give him this spell? You know, because then he's just falling all over the place, you know, randomly and he doesn't get any penalty of any kind. So then I mean there are a few players who are uh, like you know, you can see when Messi plays he generally tries to stay up no matter what happens. And and then there are others who are just falling over at every opportunity because FIFA just hasn't really given the rest of the mandate from really calls to give a card for simulation. It's on the books, but it's never called. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of curious. How much do you think the incident with Luis Suarez took away from the World Cup? <laughs> did it really take away from the World Cup, or did it just add to the craziness? I don't know. Like I said, best of times, worst of times. He really punished both himself and his country because you saw how Uruguay went far, and they still have a lot of their talent. And how ineffective they were in the two games they didn't have. Yeah, they didn't have them. So he really like shot himself and his team in the foot. And if anyone is passionate about his team, it's him. So to me, it was like a karmic circle. And for everybody else, it was just kind of this crazy circus atmosphere that just added to the whole... Well, what, like, now, going now, into it, I didn't know anything about it and uh, anything about his reputation. When yeah. I'm watching the match, my first question was, did he just headbutt the guy? And when they showed the angle, like, he bit him. Yeah. And then you hear the announcement, oh, he's a cannibal. And then the final, yeah. like, he how, place a bet on whether or not he was going to fight someone during the world. But world here world. is how, Big time. how good is SWAT is, right? That it's Barcelona that picked him up, right? How good is Swatting? You're taking a guy that's bitten people three times, right? Yet, Barca, one of the greatest teams in the world that already has Neymar, that already has Messi, is saying, we want Suarez too, baby, even though he bites people. Welcome. Does that speak volumes of how good of a player this guy is? Absolutely. I think, I think you also have to look at the fact that, you know, with Suarez, Uruguay gets to the semifinals. Without Suarez, you saw how they were in that first game and how they went out immediately after his suspension. But it just it just makes you wonder, what is it like to have the kind of talent Luis Suarez has and then also have this impulse to bite people? Like, where is that? I mean, you're already that good. And then suddenly you're like... <laughs> yeah, it makes no sense. I know, but I when he, you know, I think it's one of those impulses. Maybe, maybe superstar athletes get to the point where nobody tells them no, so they start thinking those things aren't acceptable. And you know, and she could ask the highest question. We saw when, when Brazil lost Neymar out of the team. You know, even if, I don't, I'm wondering even if he had played and Silva played against Germany, would it matter? They still may have lost, but they may not have given up seven goals. Yeah, undoubtedly, they probably would not have given up seven goals. But the bottom line is, um, Brazil never used to be so fragile. It's, it's one thing to look at Uruguay, they're a smaller country. And um, and frankly, the, their domestic league has really struggled. But Brazil is supposed to send players you know, to the best leagues in the world all the time. They should not be so dependent on just one player um, to, to go down in such humiliating fashion. And I really think that this should hopefully prompt a reassessment of their system, their players, and their coaching. You, you know, we had talked about it early on and uh, on our show, and we said, how good is Brazil this time around? It's a young team. I didn't see, after Neymar and, and, uh, and Luis, I didn't really see, and maybe Silva, I didn't see what I saw in the team with Romario and Bebeto. You know, with Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, those teams. I, I just didn't see that. Dunga. So I knew at some point, yeah, Dunga, Tafarel. I just I just see this team as a team that at some point they were young. And at some point they were just not as deep as other Brazil teams were. So although I did not fully expect them to get beat down the way they did. Because you think about it, the U.S., as a, they can say whatever they want. We didn't get beat down like that. To see Brazil get beat down like that and get beat down 
in back-to-back -back games. And I know they don't have their leaders, but come on, you're gonna tell me that we're not that deep? I mean, look, it can snowball. All of us that have been involved in sports know all of a sudden you're getting your tail kicked in, you can't stop it. And we've been there, and I understand that aspect of it. But I don't know, I think there was a lot of things wrong. I think there was a lot of guys, and we talked about it on the show, Rafael, that said there was a lot of guys like Kaká that should have been on that team that still can play ball. Hey, and we said, right, Robinho's son were still kicking the soccer ball, and he wasn't on that team. I think Brazil has to look really hard at themselves and say, we have ourselves to blame, and as much as I love Scolari, and I think that he gets a free pass because he's 1-1, one -one, taking Portugal to the semifinals, he has to look at himself in the mirror and say, I jacked this up, man. Like I said, a complete reassessment. And then sometimes I'm surprised which teams, you know, they cling to the past. I was surprised that Spain hung on to their folks. Um, and he's, he's staying on for uh, the Euro, uh, European Cup. And I just really feel like if this World Cup didn't tell them, hey, what we've done in the past is not working anymore, we need a fresh start. But I don't know if Spain just wants to cling to that glory or like you said, because Julie Kyle won the last World Cup that Brazil did win. And they're just like, oh, well, of course he did it once before. He can do it again. Forgetting that all these years have passed and other countries have caught up and the game has refined the, the strategies. It's really more the German style now, fast and yet technical. And, and, and you know what? You're so right. Didn't schematics look like it had everything to do with how bad they were defensively? Yeah. I mean, there were, I had never seen such, such gaps in a defense. In a, in a in World Cup, unless you're talking about like you know a country that's been there for the first time, you know, and they're not, you know, they're just happy to be there. But that wasn't the case. Countries, did you see like Iran line itself up in a really good defensive effort and then break out on the counter? I mean, we didn't have the blowouts like we had before um, with you know small little countries like uh, Senegal. You know, years ago, the Germans like you know had them at eight one or something like that. Or Saudi Arabia, I think they got into the double digits. We didn't have any of those blowouts. The biggest blowouts was Netherlands versus Spain and Germany versus Brazil. And these are obviously you know running up the scoreboard on. You think about you, you. You think about that. You think about those teams that were the semis. Yeah. Everybody you just mentioned, correct? Exactly. Well, I mean that's. Yeah. That's tough. So, Nassim and Andrea, we have a question from the audience. I know we love talking about the three, the Stars and Stripes, Brazil. We have Tatiana here from New York, who's Colombiana. So, much respect to our cafeteros here. She has a question about uh, the Colombian team. Hi. So, my question is about James Rodriguez. I just, what do you see, like, his future looking like? I mean, I was very surprised that he made six goals. Uh, I think, you know, Colombia, um, the entire team deserves to be um, really celebrated for being such a big surprise, um, especially, you know, losing uh, uh, Falcao right before the World Cup, and Hamas just stepped up big time. I really think that, you know, uh, Peckerman was sort of the power behind the, the throne, you know, uh, as a coach. I think he really did well to organize the team. But you can do all the setup and the players have to go out and play. And I really think the, uh, the sky's the limit for him. He's, he's young and he really uh, was completely unafraid to have that confidence on the world's biggest stage. This is the world's biggest sporting event. This is uh, millions upon millions of people watching an entire country being so you know, focused on their national team, uh, especially with, you know, the heartaches Colombia has had in the past. I thought that was a great moment when Mondragon had in, in the goal, just those few minutes, because he was on that 94 squad as a backup. You know, which of course had, you know, the Escobar the tragedy. Union, MLS. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I interviewed him once. He's just a great, classy guy. I'm really glad he got his own goal. He had to say. But Amos is, like, obviously the breakout star, Golden Boot, and it's guys a little bit. You think he should have won player of the tournament instead of Messi? Yeah. I think, what was it? Absolutely. Even the head of FIFA said that he was surprised. 
I mean, but I've been in the press box before, and I know that reporters tend to be a little lazy. When the voting things are happening, they just check off the name that they know the most. Like, when I was covering Galaxy Games, half the time, you know, um, everyone just, like, checked off Beckham or Lana Donovan. Even if someone else had actually played better that day, Omar Gonzalez or something. So I, wanna, I actually want to ask Tatiana a question. So, are Colombian fans still bitter and think that uh, the brazil Colombia game, the refs stole that game from you? Yes. I mean, all you have to do is go through my Facebook feeds. Like, there's like all these little, you know, those little... Now, I, I, I don't want all the guys like trolling her Facebook, okay? So, <laughs> no, no. Well, her and her Colombian friends, friends. No, no. all right? I'm saying like my... It's my, not research for the I show. have way too many Colombian friends, so like... You I can never have more and the Colombian. You can't have too many like, Colombian They'll friends. have like little pictures like, yes, it was a goal. Yeah. Like, Jeff's goal was a goal. So, you'll see that. And you'll see like, we're still hurting yeah, seven days later, two weeks later, so yeah. I have one question for both ladies. Was Hamas the best looking guy in the whole World Cup? I think he was amongst the best. Yeah, I know in my circle, everyone was talking about Hamas. Andrea, what did you think? Chris, Chris, Chris. Chris, she's a Ronaldo girl. No, actually, I would say Hamas is way above Ronaldo. I was just trying to like mentally of the ones I can like, immediately think of, yeah, I would put them uh, at or near the top. But yeah, I mean, yeah. He got a lot of plug on Univision, man. But They're think, going nuts over it. I think that even added to part of the whole spectacle of the World Cup. I mean, the, uh, the camera work has gotten better, and all these fans who watch it once every four years. I mean, I have to say, you know, speak on behalf of the females, uh, the reaction that I got from some, you know, suddenly interested in soccer, and asking me if they can come to games. Yeah, this is an interesting question. Players, you know, and they can see that they're good looking, and they're fit, and then, you know, I mean, as opposed to, well, you know, American football, they wear helmets and things like that. You can't even see their faces. All the girls who, you know, love a uh, good looking face, handsome face, they, they were just oh, really now, enjoying now, that stuff. Now the, now the players are eye candy. No, but not only that, like, they'll even oh, oh, comb their on, hair, on, on, like, for games. No, like, not only that, like, the, the soccer players, they actually comb their hair. You see Cristiano Ronaldo changes his haircut. And well, yeah, Neymar, too. Yeah, it's actually a nice story that that, that shaved into his head for, for some cancer patient. Yeah, that was awesome. a weird design. He does a lot of that, man. He needs to be commended for that. So that that was really nice. And, and uh, let, let me ask you guys this. Do you guys think Suarez is handsome? Suarez? Yeah. I don't know. I just and are you oh, and are you turned off by the bike? <laughs> well, well. Uh, is that? Strange. <laughs> <laughs> I like Rick James. I like Rick James. I like Rick James. I'm just throwing it out there. I mean, you have to think for Suarez especially because he kind of has, you know, like these big horse teeth in the first place. <laughs> you know, <laughs> 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 ah. <laughs> I did think it was funny though because uh, the first thing that my friend uh, texted me when Uruguay's game came on is their shirts are really tight. It's pretty. <laughs> Uruguay did have these very uh, tight sleeves. That's awesome. Cool. cool. Andreas, I, I really want to thank you for taking time to come sit with us at Latino Sports Soccer at Bottles Restaurant. Got a little World Cup soccer with us. Uh, is there anything you want to uh, promote? Anything you want to plug that you're doing right now? Um, well, the uh, Liga MX is starting. So all of you who are fans of Liga MX, there's lots of transfers coming on. I'm going to be the main blogger for Blue America. Las Aguilas. Oh, you're for Chiba. For Chiba. You're for Chiba. Uh, Tom Marshall covers Chiba. Uh, so, ESPN FC is revamping the site and adding more uh, information. A lot of people noticed that we did a whole redesign for the World Cup. We're continuing that for the new season of Liga MX. And, uh, 
Right now, I'm working on some preview pieces. I'm also going to be covering the match between Manchester United. If Chicharito is still with the team, there's still rumors that he might transfer soon. Um, but if he doesn't, then I'm going to be there and hopefully have an article on him really soon. This time next week, yeah. It should be out because the game is on Wednesday. So, yeah, you can find my articles on ESPN FC. And I occasionally am a guest on this one. Andrea, I want to tell you that one of the coolest things is that you're on the biggest sports network in the world. And you believe enough in the Latino Sports Talk cause to come out on our show. And that means the world to us. Not only as people that are trying to make the show happen, but as Latinos, because that's why you showed up. Because you care about what we're doing as people. Thank you so much. We can't thank you enough. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're, we're starting to wrap it up here, and I want to thank Andres Soccer Canales for coming out. Yeah, let's give it up for Andres, everybody! Yeah. And, I, and I want to thank Alex Espinosa for spending some time with us today, talking welcome. about his great yes. NFL performance. Yeah, Alex! You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, you know, normally at the end of our shows, we have something we call a rant. And I think it'd be fitting if we end our show on a rant, and I'm gonna let our Arizona guest start it off. First of all, the reason you have not heard a lot from Renee today is because Renee is doing a lot of the bulk of the work. Guys. Been behind we could not do this show without Renee. Let's give it up Thank you, for Renee. Renee Gomez, everybody, from the land of the sun. All right, Renee, what do you have to rant about this week? Well, I didn't really have a rant prepared, but I do uh, I do want to take the opportunity for uh, the people who are here to let them know that we're actually going to expand the coverage for Latino Sports Talk. Uh, we've grown enormously. We've got lots of people who are doing shows. Here's one example. We got the LA guys. Of course, on the East Coast, we have Jorge the Dominican Baller Martinez who called in earlier this evening as well as uh, Armando Perez, who's going to be joining him doing a show on a weekly basis. And, uh, and then, of course, myself with the mad Mexican Angel Hernandez Rivera. You know, he, he wasn't able to call in tonight, unfortunately. But, uh, but yes, so we're going from one show per week to three shows. It's exciting times here at Latino Sports Talk. So that's kind of something we really want, wanted to announce tonight as well. Um, and then, of course, we got to thank the man, Ray Collazo. Ray, thank you. We can't do this without you, brother. This guy, I gotta say, this guy, for him to open up this forum for us to be able to do this has just been awesome, and I want to personally thank you because, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, before we were, we had never really met before, and now look, we got a strong family at Latino Sports Talk, part of the Race Podcast Network, so I just wanted to personally say thank yeah, you. Yeah, I want to well, thank you, Renee, and I want to thank Renee for not reporting me to the police, because I think you were the first guy I recruited to be part of the crew on Facebook, and uh, you responded really positively. I want to shout out, there's a lot of people that are a part of the Latino Sports Talk family that aren't here, besides Jorge Monte, Argentina Alex, Joanna from Arizona, uh, what's, his name? Uh, what's the new guy from Cleveland, um, Rogelio from Cleveland, yes. Uh, we have about uh, Steeler Charlie Blanco, our big Steeler fan. We have about 20, 30 people around the country. That, that guy's amazing. Uh, special correspondent. So we got a big family out there. But this was the first. We wanted to do the first live remote in L.A. because of the leadership of George and Asim and Jim, of course. So, you know, we're going to be continue to do, uh, continue to grow the network. And there's a lot of potential. I mean, when I'm sitting in the offices of the New York Times and the New York Times leadership is saying, you guys are on to something, keep doing it. We're on to something really major here, and uh, and again, I want to reiterate your words on Andrea Canales. Thank her for her leadership and Absolutely. being a part of this. So uh, maybe you can tell Robert Flores to return my tweets, Andrea. But that's <laughs> that's another conversation. Uh, but we're we're perfectly happy with Andrea. But thank you guys, and I want the LA guys to kind of wrap up the show. And and thanks again. And I want lastly also, if you like what you heard, we're on iTunes. You can check out Latino Sports Talk on iTunes or Stitcher and different apps, um, as well as just check out the shows. Uh, this was fun today, man. You know, the coolest thing about today, none of us had met each other. I think George, myself, and Jim, we're friends, but we never had met Ray. We had never met Renee. 
We got together and we did this today. Hey, we have one of the best podcasts, if not the best Latino podcast. And and when you're getting the best downloads for a World Cup uh, preview, we're doing something right, guys. And uh, I think we bring you talk that fits our gente, man, which is so important. And uh, Ray, you're the, the brainchild behind that, man. Thank you so much, Thank brother. You, brother. Thank you. Uh, I just want to close, you know, normally uh, my family has a tradition in, in, in November. Uh, we do, we, get, we go around giving thanks, and I'm actually going to do that today. Uh, first, I want to thank good friend Jim Luhan for introducing me to Ray, getting me on his show. And uh, I want to thank Ray for, for calling me and calling me and calling me to get me to do this show. Thank you for seeing the potential you, you saw in me to, come, to get me to come on and be a co-host. And I got a chance to meet some great people. You, Jorge, the Mad Mexican, Renee, and the list keeps going on with all the people around the country. And a big shout out to my wife, Diana, for actually being on board with us. Thank you. She knows every Friday night, every Friday night, a two, two and a half hour window. I'm not there with her, helping with the kids. And for her to support me on this avenue is, is I can't. Say thank you enough, man. Well, we can't I say love you. you enough, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really. And it, did, really. it means a lot to us. Thank you. And, uh, and that's why I'll be rooting for the Angels in that uh, LA series. <laughs> and I just, you know, it's, it's been a blast and it's just going to keep getting even better. And uh, I see our family growing, our Latino Sports Talk family growing. And I'm looking forward to bigger and better things. Absolutely. And just uh, real quickly, just one last shout out. Um, I, I, we've developed a Best of Race podcast CD. This has uh, mostly my commentary, but some of the highlights of the kind of discussions and motivational conversations, thought-provoking conversations we've had. It's a bit of a fundraising effort. We have an hour of content here, so if anyone would like, could make a donation to purchase one of our CDs to help the cause to pay for some of the basic uh, fees associated with having uh, uh, internet radio operation. We really appreciate it. There's a lot of good information on here. And for the people that stuck around, I want to thank our sports fans that were here that stuck through the race podcast. And I think you guys dug it a little bit. So I appreciate your your interest. And, uh, and also, like everybody, like everyone that came, my coworkers, the people that are here, Jackie, who stuck around. And I want to thank everyone. And let's keep this this movement. I'm sorry, this. The young guy that's videotaping, what's your name? Ted, 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 thank you, Ted. Ted. Ray, before Man, we go. Thank, thank you, we really appreciate you. Before, thank you. before we go, Ray, I know yes. you're here for a very special cause this weekend. Uh, why don't you tell the, fan, uh, the listeners Absolutely. what you're doing? Yeah, so uh, my day work, I work for the National Council of La Raza. We're the largest Hispanic civil rights organization in the country, so my coworkers are here. So we're going to have a conference starting Saturday uh, through Tuesday at the LA Convention Center. Bring your family Saturday and Sunday. We're going to have a big family expo free. For everyone, giveaways, prizes, celebrity autographs. Uh, you can pick up a bunch of free uh, lotions and then like free uh, items for your family. We're gonna have a kids soccer tournament, and uh, so yeah. So if you're gonna be in downtown LA, come by for the LA Convention Center, and there's gonna be a lot of the workshops also for free. So if you uh, look at the schedule, want more information, you can talk to me afterwards. But yeah, we'll be real for the next several days. And Sunday, I'll be out working and. I know the Latino Sports uh, Talk families are going to stop by with their kids, and so you, you all are free to walk, uh, join us this weekend. Have a great sports weekend, LA fans. All right, all right. thank you. Yeah.